Good evening. I'm Bob Becker, director of the Strom Thurmond Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's program. This is the last Calhoun lecture in the 2009-2010 series, and I'd be remiss if I didn't thank all of those who put so much time and effort into making this, uh, this program successful. A uh, special thanks to the patrons of the Calhoun Lecture Series. Uh, without your energy contributions and more importantly, uh, or equally importantly, without your money, uh, we wouldn't be able to pull this, put this series on. As you know, it doesn't take much to read the newspaper and see what state uh, our uh, South Carolina's finances are in. And so it's private actions that will make things happen these days. Uh, for the past two seasons, we, uh, we've had a wonderful pair of co-chairs uh, pull together the leadership of this program, and Dot and Bruce Yandel. And so, Dot and Bruce, please put your hands up. I can see you. The lights are lower today. Thank you very much. And the incoming chairs, uh, who will accept any ideas you have, plus any memberships you want to contribute, are Jim and Darlene Duffy. And Jim and Darlene, please put your hands up. Thank you very much. Now this is a semi-sad evening for me uh, because this is also the final uh, lecture that uh, one of my leadership team members at the Strom Thurmond Institute, Ms. Donna Arterburn, uh, will have directed. Uh, a lot of you know Donna from working at, with the Calhoun Lecture Series and uh, she has put on and managed over 44 of, the, 44 of these programs. But I've known Donna as uh, the program manager for the Institute for, over, for about 19 years as, since I've been director. And she worked with the previous directors uh, uh, before that. But the thing about Donna is you could always seems to anticipate what we needed. Uh, every program, I never had to worry that things would come off. Uh, she do, did it so well and it made it seem so effortless, but the details and the work that goes into putting on regular programs and in the years we've been there, it's over 400 of them at the Thurman Institute and here, uh, that uh, it's hard to imagine that uh, a harder job that makes that, that's made to seem so easy by the skill of this great person. So where is Donna? Is she still loitering back there? I want her out here. I just want to, I want you to meet her if you have never met her, and I want to thank her again for all her fine work. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I've tried to make her stay, but she's, she won't. <laughs> no. Uh, following uh, Mr. Smith's remarks today, we'll, we'll have our usual conversation, but this conversation is interesting because all the members in it are consummate newspaper individuals. They've all worked well in communication areas and all have strong backgrounds in journalism. I want to introduce the panel for you because they'll just, just be coming up onto the stage after the, uh, Mr. Smith's comments. First, Ms. Beth Padgett. Beth, raise your hand. Uh, Beth is a familiar figure to those of us who follow the Greenville News. She's been the editorial page editor since 2000. Prior to that, she served as deputy editorial page editor with the Greenville News and as editorial page editor and writer for the uh, Greenville Piedmont. She's one of the most knowledgeable people uh, in newspapers in South Carolina, and we're very pleased to have her with us on this panel this evening. Beth Padgett, please. Our second discussant is Kathy Sands, and Kathy is Chief Public Affairs Officer and Assistant to the President at Clemson. She's responsible for all institutional communications, marketing, and media relations, good and bad, and she's the first one to get the calls. Uh, this semester, Clemson's Public Affairs off Office earned a grand award as the best overall communications program at the Southeast Meeting of the Council for Advancement and Support of Education. And this was a tough year. So, uh, Kathy, thank you very much. Now, one of the outcomes of this digital age is the rise of the immediate. We have a 24-7, minute-by-minute news flow, and we've all seen the decline, if not the prelude, to the demise of what we've hailed in this country as the fourth estate, our press. You know, thoughtful comment and careful reporting are giving way to blogs and to opinioned celebrity. Where would we be without the Huffington Post? Um, I know many of us look at this thing and say, my gosh, where are we headed? We're at a churn, we're at this major paradigm shift. Are we going to see now a passing into a new phase where we can't really critique what's being said very well? 
Many highly regarded newspapers, such as the Christian Science Monitor, are carried now only on the internet, and to many of us, this too is a loss. Our speaker tonight, Jay Smith, is well versed in this trend and in the shifting news business models. Jay retired as president of Cox Newspapers in 2008. In his newspaper career, which spans over 40 years, Jay served 37 years of those with Cox, including his role as publisher to the renowned Atlanta Journal-Constitution from 1986 to 1992. A native of Cincinnati, Ohio, he earned a degree in journalism from The Ohio State University, where he met his wife, Susan, who's also a grad from Ohio State. The Smiths have a strong tie with Clemson, as we heard previously. Uh, Susan's cousin, Scott Schiff, is a professor in civil engineering, and the Schiff family is here to join us for this evening. Welcome very much. Welcome. In, a, in addition to his career, Mr. Smith is a strong civic leader in Atlanta. He's been on the board of the United Way and is leading a major capital campaign for the uh, Salvation Army in Atlanta. Please welcome Jay Smith. Bob, thank you very much. I feel as if we have uh, met previously. Bob was kind enough to uh, call me in Atlanta and interview me for a radio show he does here. And I was uh, thrilled when several of you said you had heard the radio show, but uh, did you really have to say it was the questions and not the answers that <laughs> made the show what it was? It was a good job, Bob. As uh, I went about preparing my remarks, I uh, spent a lot of time sitting in front of uh, my computer at home, and uh, in the course of that, up popped an email from my wife Susan, who was down in the kitchen. And uh, the subject was uh, from Garrison Keeler, and it simply said this, and, and my wife, as you will quickly discover, is about as subtle as a sledgehammer. Here's what Garrison Keillor said, and here's what Susan thought. A good sermon is like a woman's skirt, short enough to arouse interest and long enough to cover the essentials. <laughs> well, I promise uh, I will be brief. I can't guarantee that I will touch on all of the essentials. For U.S. newspapers, as Bob said, U.S. newspapers are in a mess, and in case you haven't noticed, our country's not doing so well either, and that is bad news for all of us. From civil rights to Watergate to Enron, Iraq, Afghanistan, Wall Street, Washington, you get the idea. Newspapers have held up a mirror to America, given it an honest look at itself, then chronicled the response, and the mirror has seldom gotten it wrong. But something feels different now. Cynicism runs rampant. Mean-spirited cable and radio commentators spew invective, and their numbers all across the political spectrum are growing. No one dares to knock them off their soapboxes. Politicos, batter each other senseless, then climb atop their foes to proclaim victory, at least for one news cycle. Business leaders, they vilify regulators. In turn, new age populists call corporate executives gluttons. The name calling grows and no one seems capable or ready to referee. We've lost touch with the center and that's the place where most of us live. We watch with a bemusement that quickly turns to horror and ultimately to dread. Now we've seen times like these before and we found our way home. It's what the founding fathers expected of us. Truth, as we all know, is elusive, but it's invariably found in the wisdom of the masses. Talk to enough people, Listen carefully, record their words, and truth will materialize as if emerging from the fog. The pursuit of truth is what compelled me to a career in journalism. 
newspaper journalism. Newspapers played by a higher standard. One source was never enough. Two, barely good enough. Better yet, get it in writing. Public documents were like gold. If someone told you something, you needed to understand the why behind what you were told. Newspaper journalism meant having the time and the resources to hunt a story down. It meant convincing tough-minded editors you'd left no question unanswered. Getting a story published was not unlike serving a day of basic training. You were exhausted, but you knew you'd done something special. You brought light to the place where you lived. Even if that brand of journalism finds its life today in a digital world, it's good, old-fashioned newspaper journalism that matters most to me. And that's what I want to talk about. Because you are here this evening, it tells me it matters to you too. A beacon, the newspaper beacon that has so often guided us, has grown dim. Friends who once used to chide me about something the newspaper published now worry aloud about their hometown daily's survival. They knew my hide was thick enough to absorb their criticism because we both knew their concern for truth was genuine. That they believed their newspaper would provide truth was the highest compliment of all. What we once took for granted is very much in doubt. How did it come to this? I'd like to offer you a little bit of a business side primer as to what the evolution of newspapers over my 40 years has seen. During those 40 years, U.S. dailies have remained the top source of news and information for the communities they serve. Note that I use the present tense. According to a recent study by a unit of the Pew Research Center, and I quote, Although there are more places to go for local news, the great majority, 83%, of actual reporting still comes from newspapers, unquote. Smart consumers once read newspapers in numbers that attracted advertisers who spent large sums in hopes of catching readers' attention. That's the business model. That's the business model that drove newspapers. Build and serve a desirable audience, with modest subscription prices and harvest a fortune from advertisers. Some noble publishers use this model wisely and they serve their communities well. Others published weak newspapers and stuffed their pockets with cash. 20 to 40 cents, depending upon whether you were that noble or the less than noble publisher, 20 to 40 cents of every dollar of revenue turned to profit depending upon the commitment of the publisher to improve the newspaper and to serve the community. Newspapers, we used to joke, had a license to print money. But the world changed and newspapers did not. Competition for consumers' time, as well as an array of other media choices, changed the game. Each year, newspapers lost a bit more of their valuable audience to other media. Each year, advertisers grudgingly paid a little more for a dwindling audience share, and yet newspapers remained resolute in their belief that they were the kings of their own domain. They were, in their own minds, in the minds of those publishers, the most important media figures in the cities and towns where they published. Yet again, we discover that hubris can be a dreadful thing. The mid-1990s brought two very different realities to U.S. newspapers. Each, in its own way, was a Trojan horse. An overheated economy meant record-breaking prosperity for newspapers. Fueling that economy was a technological breakthrough that carried great opportunity and potential disaster. And that was the Internet. Many publishers and editors saw the internet as little more than a new medium by which readers would get the same news online that they got in print. They repeated the mistake radio station owners made when television emerged, and they thought 
they could master that new medium. Like television, which showed that talking heads were not enough, the internet quickly evolved into a utilitarian medium that gave users what they wanted, when they wanted it, and how they wanted it. Classified advertising, as it turned out, not news, became the first battleground between newspaper publishers and risk-taking, laser-beam-focused internet entrepreneurs who gobbled great chunks of former newspaper classifieds. And classifieds, to be sure we all understand, are often called by many of us the want ads. To give you a sense of their importance to newspapers, they account for about 40% 40% of a newspaper's advertising revenue, and just as important, they serve as community marketplaces. Yet even in the face of this late 90s assault, early 2000s assault, newspaper companies largely continued to pursue their narrow interests. Tradition, lethargy, and an aversion to risk cemented newspapers to their old ways. Having vanquished radio, TV, cable, direct mail, in earlier times, newspapers might lose some battles for the internet, but they thought they would prevail. When newspapers should have been shifting their competitive balance to the balls of their feet, they remained on their heels. And then things got really bad. The new millennium brought a dot-com crash, 9-11, and wars on two fronts. As the U.S. economy sagged, advertisers cut budgets, consolidated, or closed their doors. Yet, competition for the ad dollar grew, especially among those who turned early internet missteps into dynamos with names like Google, Yahoo, and Craigslist. Newspapers blew their chance to morph into meaningful internet players. Overnight, highly profitable newspapers saw fortunes vanish. They cut expenses, often on the backs of newsrooms. With rare exception, panic had taken hold, and nothing good ever comes of fear. The late Skip Carey, for those of you who follow the Atlanta Braves, he was a curmudgeon who called the Braves games on television and radio and Skip, who was a friend, possessed a healthy disregard for the, quote, geniuses, unquote, who controlled baseball. To paraphrase Skip, try as they might, the game is too good for them to screw up. Deep down, while he was a curmudgeon, Skip was an optimist. So too am I. I share Skip's disregard for the geniuses who got newspapers into this mess. Journalism was too good to really mess up. Journalism, especially the here's what happened, here's why it's important, and here's what you can do about it kind that real newspaper men and women practice, it will find a way to survive. Like Humpty Dumpty, we may not be able to put back together the brilliant business model that supported newspapers so well for so long, but real journalism will survive. It must. So how? I had my shot. I've gotten out of the way of those who continue to search, but that doesn't mean for one moment that I've stopped thinking about, rooting for, or helping those who continue to try. Honestly, that's why I accepted this invitation to speak. Some say government funding can save newspapers. I say absolutely not. For I'd rather live without newspapers than have newspapers beholden to public officials who, real or perceived, dictate what we know. It's a temptation just far too great for any public official to resist. But there are some other possible saviors. Remember those who got rich in the glory days of newspapers? Yeah, some blew their fortunes, but others invested wisely. Is it time? to return some of those dollars from those other investments to newspapers? And where are the philanthropists whose greatest gift to their hometowns could be the gift of information, the gift of knowledge, the stuff that drives a democracy? The late Joan Kroc breathed new life into national public radio with an earth-shaking bequest of 200 million. 
So who will be the Joan Croc for local newspapers? But in the end, in the end, newspapers must build a new business model to survive. A financially weak newspaper is a toothless tiger. New era publishers must acknowledge that the days of big returns on investment, at least for now, are over. They won't be able to proclaim piously their commitment to public service and then count the fortune in the back room. They'll have to mean what they say and fight like never before for financial survival. How might they do this? Well, it starts with the undying belief that the newsroom is the heart and soul of a newspaper. It doesn't matter whether that newsroom's work appears in ink on paper, although that's my preference, or digitally. If, in fact, the newspaper goes digital, its cost structure changes dramatically. Gone are warehouses of newsprint, massive presses that turn that newsprint into newspapers, and fleets of trucks and cars needed to reach readers. But for a few years at least, there remains a place for the print edition of a newspaper. It may be thinner and limited in circulation area, but it retains a well-educated, affluent, albeit older, audience that still wants to hold a newspaper that conveys an intelligent report of the day's news. That audience has been overlooked lately, but it is real. Properly served, properly marketed to advertisers, it's a valuable remnant of the traditional newspaper business model. Likewise, there is revenue to be realized with that newspaper that's online. Going forward, however, news and information must shed their reliance on advertising revenue and figure out how to earn their own way. Readers, whether of print or online, will have to pay more. If we, I'll speak as a uh, former publisher, if we give them value, give them what they need, I firmly believe they will pay up. Listen to these figures. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the average American is expected to spend, this is the average American, $997.07 in 2010 on entertainment and media, most of which goes to cable television, internet, connectivity, and video games. And that doesn't include, doesn't include the cost of cell phone service, which is about another $1,000 a year. To command a reader's loyalty and hard-earned dollars means news must be special. It cannot be found everywhere, and it must provide value in return for time and investment. Editors and publishers must protect their so-called intellectual property, but that work must live up to the claim of being intellectual. It can't be the work of bloggers posing as so-called journalists. It cannot be the work of rookies. It must be rock solid, built on reporting that takes time, effort, and resources. At a time when newspapers are weakening their news engines, they ought to be strengthening them. Experienced, fair-minded, yet skeptical, never cynical, skeptical, never cynical professionals who know how to write clearly, concisely, and colorfully have never been needed more than now. Newspapers, historically never graded alliances, need to lean on each other. Build a seamless network of newspaper professionals across this country, tie their work together, and just imagine the value of the report each newspaper could provide its audience. The well of information would be deep and it would be rich. Sports enthusiasts, for instance, could get detailed reports from every newspaper that covers every team they care about. What if, what if all the newspapers that cover Atlantic Coast Conference sports pooled their efforts? Properly edited and presented, it could open a new and valuable revenue stream for those participating newspapers. Only imagination and audience limit the list of other subject possibilities. There is one other very big impediment, and that's technology. Smart newspapers, 
especially those near each other, have entered joint production and distribution agreements. Some, including many here in South Carolina, even share content. This has cut costs and, on occasion, strengthened content, but it isn't enough to compete with the internet powerhouses. Newspaper executives have every reason to be wary of the internet heavyweights. Left to their own devices, the Googles, Yahoos, and MSNs of the world will harvest every scrap of newspaper work and repurpose it to their own needs. But we live in a land of laws that respects the importance and value of a person's work. The Associated Press has shown the way in its fight against intellectual property theft, demanding and getting compensation. Its member newspapers, either on their own or allied with the AP, must do the same. Google's Eric Schmidt has offered an olive branch to newspapers. Steve Jobs' new Apple iPad will succeed or, largely, or fail largely on its ability to gain access to content. Schmidt and Jobs are not necessarily friends to newspapers, but they are potential business partners, nothing more, nothing less. The sooner publishers and editors recognize this, the better. Neither Google nor Apple is likely to win a Pulitzer Prize anytime soon, but they could become the modern day equivalent of the printing press that ensures great journalism a way to reach the masses. Honestly, as you can probably tell by now, I have no idea how all of this will turn out. We're in the middle of a very wild scrum and the rules are being made up as the game plays out. I do believe, however, that everyday men and women, people like you and me, have the chance to have a large voice in that outcome. We will get the journalism we deserve, but only if we care enough to demand it. And it's not enough, folks, it's not enough ever to criticize. Anyone can do that. Rather, we must identify those providers of information upon which we depend. We must reward them with our time, attention, and yes, our discretionary information dollars. Another tier on the cable system Another app for the iPhone may provide entertainment, likely won't provide too much knowledge, but certainly it won't bring wisdom. We ought not to be bashful, and I hope none of you ever will be, about proclaiming our dependence on such valued and trusted sources of information as newspapers. Word of mouth, it's a powerful tool. Any savvy marketer knows that. If you truly care about quality journalism, if you believe, as I do, that journalism is a vital part of our free and open society, now is the time to act. If Oprah, God love her, if she can get entire communities to read and discuss an important book, why can't we begin a dialogue about what is news and why it matters? Visit your publisher, visit your editor. One of them will be with us in a moment on this stage. Make your voice heard. I suspect, contrary to what you might think, I suspect you will get a warm and a welcome reception. And for every spark we strike, we increase the chance that newspaper journalism, the kind that matters most, will once again catch fire. And when it does, when it does, the light and the occasional heat it gives off gives off will warm us all. A vibrant America begets healthy newspaper, healthy newspapers, and the journalism, the journalism of quality newspapers provide an effective antidote to what ails our society. As I said at the outset, right now, our country needs great newspapers and newspapers need our country. Thank you so very much for taking the time to listen.
do is they'll enjoy that. Communications people can't go anywhere without a pad and a pen. I don't, I don't know what that is about us that we, uh, we always have to have something to take a few notes. Um, I have the, uh, been given the task of being the timekeeper as well as conversation starter, so I may be looking at my watch every now and then. Um, I'd like to just start off with um, picking up on what, uh, a comment that you made regarding uh, the community you talked about local news, and I had the opportunity a few days ago to have a conversation with uh, Scott Jassick, uh, who is a, an editor of a publication, an all online publication called Inside Higher Education. And one of the comments he made about online journalism and the new media is that uh, newspapers are no longer, or, or these types of publications are not bound by geography. They're more about subject matter. And when I heard that, it occurred to me that, you know, there comes a time in your life when you need to understand what zoning is and what your school board is up to and what your city council is doing and what a mill is and all those sorts of things. And I just, it made me wonder if, um, you know, what is the future for local news if we do go solely to a, a, a non-geographic type of uh, newspaper delivery or news delivery? Um, could could local news be sort of the salvation of the of the print medium because nobody else is really covering that? Well, well Kathy, I think it is, and I think we see it uh, uh, especially in uh, small weeklies and small dailies, which, unlike uh, their big uh, city uh, cousins, are, are are really holding up financially much better. Good. They've retained the audience because while it is not uh, prize-winning stuff, and it can, in fact, make your eyes glaze over knowing what's happening with sewer rates, uh, as you said, millage rates, uh, and that is really the essence of, of, of a lot of the information we need to, to live our lives. And at the very intense local level, uh, that, I, I think we're going to see print continue for, for quite some time. Uh, the, uh, the real tough question, though, is to understand that uh, subject matter requires people who have training, who have time, and who have the resources. I can't tell you how many times I came rolling in at midnight uh, as a young reporter from a board of education meeting, and uh, uh, you wondered, was it worth it? And the answer was, of course it was, because each time you learned something, you had something later on that might have evolved into a story. My biggest fear is that uh, that we that we will lose that, and I don't want to see us lose that. Yeah. I can just uh, just uh, answer, even though the question wasn't directed to me. For at least the past five years, really for the past ten, but especially the past five years, newspapers have recognized that their salvation is local. That is drilled into every aspect of the newsroom up to the editorial page. Local, local, local. As local as our franchise, that's what readers cannot get anywhere else. Um, and I think that that is not only the salvation of newspapers, it's why, really why we need to exist. And that is that informed local community about issues that they cannot uh, pop it in Google and yeah. you know, 45 stories come up about uh, Greenville County School Board. Because if there's a story, the first or second one will almost always be, depending on how the headline was written, from the Greenville News. And that's why I think uh, newspapers are absolutely essential to this grand experiment that we have called democracy. My question, uh, Jay, is a little bit along the lines of what we were talking about in the dinner line. Um, I have, uh, I've never seen an industry, uh, in part, so eager to declare its death. Uh, I think for the past <laughs> five years, especially uh, some of the major newspapers have written uh, uh, quite a bit about the death of newspapers have written, been ready to declare our obituary. Newspapers have a powerful story to tell. Our own, and I, some readers, uh, some of our readers in the audience have mentioned how we've taken our lumps too. We are a thinner version of what we were five years ago. Uh, but still, we have more reach and more audience than any medium in this market has. In any given week, 81% of the people in Greenville and Pickens counties, in any given week, 81% of the people in Greenville and Pickens counties 
read one of our publications, whether it's the Greenville News or Greenville Online or one of our weekly publications. Each of those readers have an intersection with us at least five times a week. That is a powerful, powerful bond to our local audience. You've become part of something called the Newspaper Project that fortunately, and some of us said hallelujah when we first started seeing signs of this, you're telling that positive story that we're not dead yet. Don't write that obituary. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Why have newspapers been so slow to proclaim we're still here, we're fighting, we're struggling, but we're still here, and more importantly, they still care about us, and they show that. Well, I think the reason for uh, all this uh, naval examination uh, by newspapers is that at our worst, we are terribly uh, self-absorbed, and that's not a very appealing characteristic. Uh, a more noble explanation for why this has occurred is uh, uh, newspaper folks uh, very appropriately uh, take the view that if we're going to ask tough questions and write about other institutions, we better be prepared to do that about ourselves, and that's fair. Uh, somebody, uh, I can't recall who, once said things are never as good as we think they are, nor are they ever as bad as we uh, fear they might be, and that's very much the case with, uh, with newspapers. The statistics you cite are accurate. Uh, uh, in my remarks, uh, the study that says 83% of what we know about a place originated by somebody working in a newsroom such as yours. Uh, we've got a heck of a story to tell, but we've got to stop hanging our heads and, and feeling sorry for ourselves and uh, recognize that uh, newspapers uh, as a business proposition, heck, we're no different than any other business. How'd you like to be in the automotive sector or the airline sector or in the university sector? I mean, you know, good Lord, people in this uh, room, they're having to deal with budget cuts that are every bit as tough, if not tougher, than, than, than many of the folks in our, our industry. So I, I, I guess what I'm saying is I, I tend to be a centrist on so many things, and uh, we need to quit uh, weeping publicly about ourselves and, and just be straightforward as you were in citing those statistics about, about your newspaper, and, and I'd submit because we're going through the same thing down in Georgia that you all are going through here in South Carolina. You know, for God's sakes, tell the story. Tell the story of what uh, great universities do, because I'm not going to be bashful about telling the story about what great newspapers do, and the better and more effectively we both tell that story, the sooner we're going to get back the uh, support that we both need. Sure. You mentioned also that uh, newspapers do still, and I think this is getting back to what Beth said, have a have a very important audience, um, a well-educated, affluent, and you were doing fine until you got to older, I, but, I, but I think that's true. I, I think a lot of us out here have the same hair color. This is a very young audience This is a, yeah, yeah, right. Um, but in just thinking about the future, uh, how do we uh, reach younger readers, people who really don't get any information from print materials anymore? whether it's online, however we do it, uh, you know, they're used to the aggregators that to being able to go and just pull all kinds of information and not really have to go to one source. Um, I'm like you, I prefer print newspapers. I still miss having an afternoon paper and that's been a long time since I was able to sit down and read an afternoon paper. But um, how do we, is there any way that we can begin to bring younger people into a, into this audience. Uh, there is, but l let me say for the record, uh, there's not an old person in this room. I don't think so. You know, old, old is a state of mind, <laughs> and uh, uh, I'm sure to my uh, nearly two-year-old grandson, I probably look like a dinosaur, but I don't, I don't feel old, and I don't think any, any of you do either. Uh, the truth is, uh, uh, you put stuff in that newspaper that uh, is relevant to uh, uh, anyone, they'll read it. Uh, witness the fact that uh, uh, our cousin's basketball team's going to the state championship Saturday. I've got to believe that uh, at least he and his teammates and a whole bunch of folks in his school are going to be eager to see how the Greenville paper covers the story. Uh, I think uh, we are in a period right now where I watch 
our own kids, and they range in age from 17 up to 32, uh, issues of importance to them. Uh, we have a son, 29 years old, who's uh, trying to sell a house and buy a house. Believe me, he's paying attention. He's looking in the newspaper, but I'm thrilled, just as thrilled if he is more comfortable sitting at the desk in his law office uh, looking at the newspaper's website online for that information. And that is happening, that is happening. But to get there, uh, more than anything, we, we, we've got to be in touch. Uh, somebody uh, said to me yesterday, do you know who Lady Gaga is? And I said, yeah, unfortunately I do. Uh, but we've got to know these things. And uh, I don't know as much about her as perhaps I, I would if I were still working. <laughs> Don't really care to know that much, but uh, yeah, we've got to be we've got to be relevant. When we talk about those boring usual July statistics, young people do read newspapers. Um, they just don't read them in the frequency sometimes that that we need on our side. Um, but a lot of times uh, they will read something online or on someone else's Facebook or uh, one of the other, uh, uh, through a mobile device or something, um, and then they will go to our website or whatever to read the complete story. You mentioned um, the business models changing. That's what uh, people who work on my side of the building like to pretend doesn't exist, but in the past few years, we've become very conscious of the business side of the model. Are, do you think there's a chance we will be able to create a business model that pays for the heavy duty reporting and editing that is needed to keep solid information out there, in-depth information out there? I, I think we will, as long as uh, newspapers don't try to uh, make the big profits that they used to make. We're going to have to, and we are learning, how to live with, with lower profits, but, uh, if, if we don't do that work, we will give away the franchise. There is right now in my hometown of Atlanta, probably the, uh, the hottest local story involves the Atlanta public school system, which has been led by a dynamic, charismatic superintendent who's done a terrific job. Test scores in this era of no child left behind have just continually gone up. Well, lo and behold, uh, over the last few years, there have been hints that something wasn't quite right with a state-administered uh, test. And now we've discovered that, uh, I'm gonna get the number wrong, but it's upwards of uh, 90 schools, not just in Atlanta, but around the state, their tests appear to have an inordinate number of erasures, which is a way of saying, a fancy way of saying, somebody cheated, somebody cooked the books. That's a big, tough story to do, and the newspaper, because it invested the time and the resource to do it, did the, did the story. What the newspaper has to do, and this is, this is the key, it has got to be able to convince advertisers, people reading this story, or stories of similar nature, those are your customers. That's how you hold on to the ad revenue. Or if failing that, uh, we have a, uh, a much smaller audience who really cares about it, that's where we're gonna have to pay more for that information. That's what I'm talking about when I say we get, we're going to get the quality of journalism we deserve. It may well be that uh, we're in uh, our household, I'm, I'm sure we are at least at that average on cell expenditures, cell phone expenditures and cable and other stuff. We may well have to say, look, our household is prepared to just ante up X hundred dollars a year for, for important information, good information, solid information. But it's got, we've, we've got to know we're gonna get that. Do you see newspapers becoming essentially a niche publication? There's been talk in the, in the industry for a couple of years about that. The affluent readers, the ones who are willing to pay for that well-researched, well-written, well-presented story. Um, I, I, think, I think we've been niche for niche, niche publications for a long time. And the, uh, the best examples of niche publications are the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And God love them, uh, and, and they are both, uh, depending upon how you look at them, very different uh, creatures. 
I happen to think that they are the two best newspapers in the country today for the simple reason that even though they have suffered financial uh, losses, the people, uh, in the case of the Sulzberger family at the New York Times, and I gotta tell you, I was a real skeptic when Rupert Murdoch bought, uh, bought the Wall Street Journal, but uh, to his credit, the Wall Street Journal today, and I once worked the summer there in college, the Wall Street Journal today is a vastly better newspaper than it has been in the last 25 years because they are putting the resources in. And what they're able to do I don't know what the cost is here, but it's two bucks at the newsstand to get the journal, uh, two bucks to get the New York Times daily. It's five dollars on Sunday. That's a, that's a fair chunk of money, but uh, at least for my information dollar, it's it's some of the best money I can spend. So, yeah, I think we are we are going to uh, we've been niche. I think we're going to have to be nichier if there's such a word, and we're going to have to command the uh, uh, the revenue, we're going to have to earn those dollars from consumers the way the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal are earning them. One of the other things that you mentioned as a possible adjustment in the business model is uh, uh, greater alliances between newspapers, and that's something that we're beginning to see in some, mm -hmm. in some markets already. You mentioned the, the uh, content sharing. Uh, in some areas, newspapers that are not in competing markets share a sports writer that covers maybe Clemson University for two different newspapers that are, that are fairly close together but not direct competitors. Um, how, how do you see this evolving? It, it, well, how is this going to evolve along with the role of the Associated Press? Um, is this going to replace the, the wire services that we, as we know them now, uh, as, as newspapers build more alliances, what is the role for those types of national uh, news gathering organizations? Well, the Associated Press, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, really is a newspaper cooperative. Uh, almost every major newspaper and minor, minor newspaper yeah, is, 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 is a, a member yeah, well. of the AP and we swap information. But the Associated Press does a lot of its own enterprise reporting. When you're reading stories out of Afghanistan, Iraq, Chances are that was an AP reporter or photographer who did that work. So we've, we've got that in place. But I think what's exciting, and, and Beth and I were talking about this earlier, I don't know if the folks who read the Greenville paper are picking up on the fact that you're now carrying stories that appear in the newspapers in Columbia and in Charleston and perhaps in, in some other markets. And by doing that, by doing that, what they're giving in Greenville to their readers, presumably, is important news and information. And I'll guarantee you, the Greenville paper, as it tries to focus on Greenville and on Clemson, it's not going to be able to send somebody over to the state capitol as regularly or to hold open bureaus. And where I think it gets particularly uh, interesting is rather than uh, Greenville, trying to find the way to cover University of uh, South Carolina sports and Clemson sports. I'm going to guess Clemson is far more important. Oh, so yeah. Let, 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 <laughs> let's, our, that's our hometown football team. <laughs> let, let the state uh, cover uh, uh, that other school that other yeah. and, uh, and find a way of melding. And better yet, as, as stories develop, when you get into this fascination we have with recruitment of high school athletes, you know, why not? Why not pool those resources and cooperate uh, and figure out why uh, the old football coach uh, isn't doing a better job over at the other, uh, you see, I'm getting a mark. We're, we're doing a lot of that. Um, and to sort of answer your question, uh, AP's gonna be there, but there's gonna be more too, and it gets to what you were talking about, that in-depth, uh, more sophisticated reporting mm -hmm. that the top reporters for the state newspaper or Charleston or for us uh, are able to give because when the AP does that story, it's eight inches on the wire mm -hmm. versus 35 inches that carries the state yeah. newspapers, uh, by, their reporters byline and their, um, the paper's designation. And we're not sure where it's going to end, but right now there's some very exciting possibilities. We used to have a Columbia Bureau d dedicated specifically to Carolina uh, Carolina sports, mainly Carolina football. We cover those games live, but we also carry state newspaper copy about Carolina football, and they do the same, and Charleston does the same with Clemson. We do it some on news stories, 
high profile news stories that they break. Uh, also, and I, I wish I could think of a, a, a specific, someone important comes to Charleston and you want to uh, have live coverage of that, that's beyond that eight inches, and we will carry the Charleston Post and Courier uh, story mm -hmm. on that. Or there are other opportunities if, you know, to back to the topic of higher education in South Carolina, mm -hmm. Uh, it's a pretty heavy load for any one newspaper to devote what if mm -hmm. uh, there is an alliance of the Gannett-owned Greenville newspaper, the McClatchy-owned uh, Columbia newspaper, and together you pool your resources and you commit that on a given Sunday you're both going to run the same in-depth story that looks at what, uh, uh, what, what the issues are, but better yet, you know, what might be some of the mm -hmm. solutions. That, that, that to me is quality, important journalism that I'll guarantee you the people in this audience would care about. Okay, I think I'd have to call time, but I'll give you one last, since I went first, to give you one more opportunity to ask a question. Wow, this went too fast. It did. Um, I can't believe it. Or maybe not fast <laughs> enough. <laughs> I was um, on a moderating, moderating a leadership Greenville panel yesterday on education, and we had the state superintendent, uh, the candidates running for state superintendent of education. And one of the questions from the audience was, beyond altruistic reasons, why should a high school student even consider going into teaching? Which uh, I thought the best answer came from one of the candidates who has a daughter who's graduating from Greenville High School, about to go into college, to go to in, into teaching, who said you can't completely divorce the altruism from the profession. If there's a student at Clemson who is thinking about going into newspapers, who wants to be a newspaper reporter, what advice would you give him or her? Do what your heart tells you to do. Uh, and I uh, uh, have had the pleasure over time to talk to a lot of uh, uh, some kids I've coached in sports, uh, family members, uh, children of friends, and uh, you know, I look back on, uh, on my life and I had no illusions. I mean, all I wanted to be was a newspaper reporter. And I say all advisedly. And I got to do that. And some other opportunities presented themselves and I took them. And I was, I was very well rewarded for, for those opportunities. But if I hadn't been, and my wife's here tonight, she can tell you, I'd have been just as happy. I'd have been just as fulfilled. And I think uh, in the end, uh, this may be a naive belief on my part, and I'm maybe a bit of a Pollyanna, but I think anybody who truly has a passion for something, if they don't do that, they're gonna look up at age 40 or 50 or 60 and say, God, I missed the opportunity. You don't ever wanna do that. And the great thing is when you live your passion, it's stunning how many doors open up, how many things present themselves, and a lot of very, very good things happen. So whether it's teaching or journalism, uh, medicine, law, uh, we have a uh, guy we know who uh, was a great doctor, uh, did uh, pediatric uh, um, orthopedics, and he stopped being a doc and he's now a forest ranger out in Montana, and uh, I suspect he's a pretty happy guy. But that's, that's, that's not the uh, crisp, uh, safe answer that you give, but uh, listen to your heart. Good advice, good, good advice. Well, thank you so much again, and I want to just say thank you to everybody here for being here tonight. And um, I'll turn it back over to uh, Dr. Becker to close out the program. Well, what a great panel. Just a little remembrance of your visit. Thank you. Uh, we, we certainly appreciate you being here. And to the panel, you made the evening very well, rounded it out beautifully. It. To all of you, thank you very much for another fine season at the Calhoun. Drive safe. Thank you, Doc. Thank you.